Welcome back. I'm Gila Ross, author of Living Beautifully and host of the Parlette podcast, where we share short, relatable ideas to impact and upgrade your everyday life. I can't wait to get our teeth into this topic. <laughs> I think it's going to be quite interesting. Can people change? I think people can change. I don't know that people know how to change. Ooh, okay. Or even want to change. Okay. The rephrase was, I don't know that it's ours to judge whether or not other people can change. The only people that we can judge as to who can change are ourselves. Yeah. And, and we know whether or not we can change. We know if we've made enough progress in our lives that we can be honest with ourselves in order to change one minute so, so i'm going to back up a little bit mm -hmm. because before we can even delve into how to change do people want to change we have to know whether it's a possibility for people to change for sure Is, they can okay so we have everyone agrees on for sure we, they can change there you can the question is motivation and awareness you have to be motivated to change and you have to be aware of what it is you need to change. The first thing you have to look at is change possible. And maybe that's the better question, right? Because sometimes you're like, yeah, people can change. But like when it comes to me, <laughs> that's not happening. It's just the way I am, right? Or we don't see the problems in ourselves or whatever. So maybe the better question to ask is, is it possible? Right, before we can sort of delve into how do we change, it sounds like is everyone on agreement that we people can change? It's going to be a fascinating discussion. Let's start with an incredible story. Anyone here has heard of Rachav? Rachav. Who is Rachav? Okay, she's incredible. It's, it's a remarkable story. She was the prostitute in Jericho. Mm -hmm. That everyone in Jericho, all the all the leaders, all the kings that used to go to, like that, that's like she was like top of the tree. So what, what's the story? The Jews are traveling through the desert. They're gonna come up to Jericho. And beforehand they send spies to spy out the place to see what's going on there. Right? Because even though God had promised them that they would win the war, they still had to do every means possible to sort of figure out, like, what's the morale? What are, what are we getting ourselves into? So they come to Rachel. Why do they come to her? Because she's in with the people in power. Right? She knows, she knows, she has a finger on the pulse. What happens is that the, the spies are in her house and the soldiers get wind of the fact that there are spies in, in Jericho and they come to her house to try and find out where the spies are. So what does she do? She hides them in some sacks of, of flax that she has upstairs in her attic. She she tells the soldiers that, oh, the spies have already have already gone that way. And then she she lets them down uh, via rope, but before she lets them down, she she begs them, she says, when you come back to fight, please keep me alive right? keep me and my family alive right mm -hmm. and and she gives them a sign with the rope and um and the flax and the third thing was the window right so that, that that's how they'll know to keep her alive then she tells them go hide in the mountains for three days and once the soldiers have like looked around for you and they see that they can't find you it's safe for you to go home and she saves their lives they go back they report to Joshua that, you know, the morale is very low. The people there are afraid of the Jews. And the the people, the Jews come to Jericho. They destroy the entire city except for Rachav. And Rachav has this complete transformation. She converts to Judaism. She eventually ends up marrying Joshua, right. who is the leader of the, of the Jewish people. Uh -huh. So she has this absolute complete transformation from prostitute to lead to wife of the leader of the jewish people let me ask you a question what do you think motivated rachov in her transformational journey well she she knew that the jews were going to win yes she knew she knew that the jews were, were going to win like if you think mm -hmm. about the time period right they had come out of they had come out of Egypt. They had the plague. They, 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 you know, the Jews were on a win, right? Mm -hmm. They knew they were afraid. So she knew that, that she was afraid, but 
why? Well, firstly, I mean, it teaches us that people can change dramatically, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're left mm -hmm. with the with the with the next question. I think the more important question really is how do we how do we implement that into our lives? Because I don't know if I'm the only one here who sometimes try to change something and it's ridiculously hard, yeah. right? <laughs> we fail again and again and again, right? Mm -hmm. So 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 let's look into her story. And I think if you look on the other side, there's some sources. So we're, we're going to do some serious learning tonight. So <laughs> um, um, does anyone want to read number one, please? Source number one. She let them down the same rope and window that her patrons would come to her. She's a master of the universe. With these I have sinned, and with these forgive me. She set out to make amends for her sinful life by using the very things that she used in Dr. Rashi. This is the key to her repentance. Ibn Rashi continues, At the age of 50, she became a proselyte. She said, May I be forgiven as a reward for the rope, window, and flax. She said, Master of the universe, with these three things I have sinned, and with three things forgive me, with the rope, the flax, and the window. Because her patrons would ascend to her using a rope to climb through the window and lower themselves that way as well, also, she would hide them in the flux. And with these same things, she married it to save the messengers. So it's fascinating, if you look at it, that she had a change of heart. She knew that she wanted to change. Yet, she turns around to, to God. And instead of saying, like, you know, I've done terrible things, and I'm going to burn these things, and I'm going to destroy them, and I'm going to complete change, she says, with these three things, the rope, were, and, and we'll talk about soon what, what they signify, the rope, the window, and the flax, because that's the, those were kind of the tools of her trade. Mm -hmm. She says, with these sin, three I have, I have sinned, with these three, please forgive me, right? With the exact same tools that she used for sinning, these is, is what she's bringing to God. And we see that she saved them in the, when she's saving the spies, she uses these three tools to save the spies. What's the significance of that? Okay. Yes. Well, I mean, just the fact that whatever habit she had of using the, these things for negative outcomes, you can be stuck in a habit if you're using the same things. But if you turn around and now use them for something positive, it might actually change your habit as okay. well. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was going to say something similar, like just like money, most objects are not good or bad. It's how you use it. So by using it in a, in a holy way, you know, she transformed the object, just like they say, you're supposed to elevate. We're here to elevate the spark. So she took it and she elevated the object versus the opposite, kind of like what you said. But okay we're gonna we're gonna leave that question to the side for the moment. okay? <laughs> we're gonna go into source number two. So the source number two we took is is, a little bit of a conversation in the Talmud about repentance. Does anyone want to read it? Resh Laki Lakish yes. said, Great is repentance, for because of it premeditated sins are accounted as errors. As it says, Return, Israel, unto the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Iniquity connotes premeditation. And yet he, the prophet, which prophet is this? Hoshea. Calls it stumbling. Resh Lakish said that repentance is so great that premeditated sins are accounted as though they were merits. As it says, when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. That is no contradiction. One refers to a case of repentance from love, the other to repentance from love. Thank you. Okay, so this is, by the way, classic Talmud, right? What does the Talmud very often do? Is it brings two different sources which are seemingly contradictory, and then it gives an understanding of what it is. So the, 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 the Talmud brings two different sources. One that says that teshuva, which we mistranslate as repentance, literally actually is closer to return. Mm -hmm. But the process of teshuva, 
is so great that if someone does something premeditated and they go through this teshuva process, it's counted as though they, it was a mistake. That's what the one source is. Then in another place, Rish Lakish, the same rabbi, says teshuva is so great that someone who does something premeditated and goes through this teshuva process, it's counted as though they did something good. Think about that for a second, right? Like someone says something, someone eats a cheeseburger in Yom Kippur and they go, through, they, they, they do teshuva for it. That cheeseburger on Yom Kippur is either counted as, oh, they by mistake, it was, oops, a mistake, or it might be counted as a mitzvah if they do teshuva. So what is, firstly, which one is it? Is it that it's counted as a mistake or is it counted as a, a mitzvah? So there's no contradiction. It depends on what motivates the teshuva. If someone is motivated by a love, meaning that they love God and they think to themselves, oh my goodness, like, I love God. You know, God does so much for me. How on earth could I eat that cheeseburger in Yom Kippur? And they go through the teshuva process, <laughs> right? We'll just use something random and, and wild like that, right? And that cheeseburger now becomes a mitzvah. What it still leaves us with some questions. On the other hand, sometimes we're not motivated by love. Sometimes a person is motivated by fear or awe, right? They think to themselves, oh my goodness, they learn that you must not eat cheeseburgers on young people. And they're like, wow. Or any time. Or any time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> then what happens is that it's, it's considered as though they mis made a mistake. So I think that one's a little bit easier to understand. Why? What, what happens is, let's say the person eats the cheeseburger. It's not young people. They, they, they eat the cheeseburger. And then they realize, like, oh, my goodness, that was, a, you know, like, God is so great, and I owe God so much, and I feel terrible, or I might get punished for it, and they do teshuva because of that. That thing is considered as though it was a mistake. Why? Because they're now a person who has a greater knowledge, right? They now understand that what they did was wrong. And had they had that understanding, they probably wouldn't have done it, right? So it was kind of like a mistake. They didn't realize the impact of it. What's harder to understand is how does it, how does it work that if a person is motivated by love, that cheeseburger can now become a mitzvah? It was eaten by accident. It, it says here premeditated. Oh, premeditated. They, they, they knew it was not kosher and they ate it anyway. Premeditated is, I know it's a cheeseburger, I know it's not kosher, and I'm going to eat it anyway, right? Just so that you know there's different levels of fear of God. There's fear of punishment. There's fear of letting God down. There's fear of not fulfilling our potential. All that's considered part of fear. But it's more kind of like a master and a servant, right? A king and a servant, a queen and a servant, right? There's, there's a distance in that relationship, right? So a person who goes, who sins, and then has that you know through or is motivated like i can't believe i let the king down or i let myself down or whatever it is then it becomes something that that's not that's sort of a mistake now the love relationship is different the love relationship there's a closeness and what happens in that love relationship and we'll see how this actually plays out in human relationships as well that a person does something and there's an energy that drives that action, right? The person eats the cheeseburger, for example, there's an energy that drives it. Maybe it's the pursuit of pleasure, whatever it is. Now, what happens is that when a person repents from love, then they can take that energy that drove that the sin and they can redirect it for the positive. If you think about it, like, for example, let's use the example of Lashon Hara. What's the energy that drives us to talk bad about other people? And I want to I want to clarify the question by specifically talking bad about other people and not thinking bad about other people. Gossip. What's the energy that drives mindless gossip? Gossip. Like gossip. Uh, some sort of wanting to create a close relationship with other people or acceptance. Like right. Right. Connection. Yeah. Right. Connection. Right. It's so often if you think about it. We're in a group, we, we're, we're gossiping with others. There's a, a drive for connection. 
Is that drive for connection positive or negative? It depends. Well, no, in, in this case of, of the Lush and Colorado, it's clearly a negative. No, it depends. Having the drive is positive. The way that you're going about fulfilling the drive is negative. Okay, so it was a trick question. <laughs> because the drive itself, we tend to think of, oh, is that good or bad? That's the wrong question when it comes. The drive itself is either more powerful or less powerful. Someone who has a very strong drive for connection, that drive itself is neither positive nor negative. It's, they have a very strong a drive for connection. Now, someone who has less of a drive, it's also neither negative or positive. It's just less powerful. Now, Rachel is teaching us something phenomenal. She's saying, you want to change properly? What you have to do is you have to maintain that energy that powered those actions and learn to use it for the positive. Someone who got, who's a gossip, they have an incredible drive to connect with other people. And if they really want to change, if they really like, want to change sincerely and in a way that's sustainable, they have to learn to take that drive and channel it in the positive. Volunteer, right? Visit lonely people, visit people, be a friend to other people. Because what Rachel is, is, is telling us is that she understood that, you know, when she takes her three things, right? What is she, what is she saying, right? You know, God needs her window and her and her rope and, and, and her flax. Absolutely not. But she's saying she's understanding herself. She's saying that I she was really good at what she did. Why? Because she had an incredible drive for connection. She said, I'm gonna take that energy that drove my sins, that drove my mistakes, and I'm going to channel it to connect to you, God. I'm going to um, um, channel it to connect to the Jewish people. And that's how she does. She makes that transformation from prostitute to wife of the leader of the Jewish people. Because she understood that, that the energy itself is neutral. It's how we channel the energy. And I think sometimes when we try and change, we kind of try and like ignore that part of it. And... Yes, sometimes that's right. That needs to be done, right? There's there's two aspects of um in Hebrew the phrase is sur mira be asay tov, leave the bad behind and do good. And it's yeah, sometimes you have to make a stop and you have to stop doing things. But real and lasting change happens when we understand our drive and we understand how to how to channel it um for the positive. Is, yes. Is that like I don't know, I hear this over and over where uh, somebody's born with the drive to take a knife and, and slaughter things and they could become an axe murderer, they could become a shohan. Yes, so so I believe the Talmud talks about it, that we have certain personality traits, right? Someone could be bloodthirsty, right? Yeah. You know, and they can become a murderer. They can become, you know, a neutral is considered a, a shochet, or they can become someone who's a moa, right? Or a doctor, right? There's a certain, you've got to have a certain level of someone who's a surgeon. You've got to have a certain level of comfort with that sort of thing. Again, the drive, the energy, the drive is not, the energy, the drive that's driving that behavior is, is not bad. It's how the person chooses to channel. That's, yeah, that's a great example was right <laughs> yeah so so um okay let's let's so, so source number four we'll read it okay it's a short one <laughs> you should not seek after your own heart and your own eyes which incline you to go astray literally which you stray after eyes the eye sees the heart desires and the body sins rachov is is the the fact that rachov prayed that those three things, the flax, the rope, the window, they were not just a coincidence, right? They were they were symbolic of the fact that that when when we sin, there's almost like three steps to failure. What happened, and and, and the the um the Chumash talks about it here, is first the eye sees. We see something, we notice something, then the heart desires it. And then the body actually does it. And those three things are symbolic of it. What, what do you think could, might be the eye sees? 
The window. The window. Okay. Now, does anyone want to read source five and then we'll see what the other two are, are symbolic of? You can read it. Oh, thank you, Robin. Raw flax must be processed to be useful. It must be woven into cloth and rope. The Hebrew word for cloth, bad, is derived from the root word badad. Badad means alone. Everything that is alone in the world desires connection. This is why flax waits to be woven. Rope or cloth created from strands of flax is the connection. Right. So, so basically what it's showing here is that the connection between flax and rope is flax is the raw product. And rope is what happens when you connect the, the flax together, you get the connection, right? We're all wired for connection. As human beings, we're all wired for connection. And that drive for connection is a very powerful drive and it can bring us closer to God and bring us closer to other people. And it can also be divisive and it could be that force for other things. Now, what Rachov understood here is that she, she saw these three things, right? She understood the window, the window that shows you outside, right? That was the the eye that sees. And then she understood that the, the flax was the raw product, the raw design. And the, the action is the rope, right? Of the, the um, bringing the flax together. And she, she understood that these are kind of the raw products of what throws us off. And she's gonna take that energy that drove her to become the most popular um, prostitute in Jericho. She She's now brought these three things to God and said, with these I sinned, and now I'm going to take that same energy and I'm going to dedicate it to you. And that is how I'm going to kind of do my teshuva do, um, transform myself. And I think it's an incredible, incredible thing that we can learn to understand about ourselves is that can people change? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the more we kind of understand ourselves and understand what energizes us and what drives us, then we can learn to un understand how to channel that in a positive way. So we look at the things that we do wrong, especially we're coming up to our Shani and Kibble, we can look at like something we want to change for the next year and try and understand like what's the drive that drives us to do that? And how can I channel it in a more positive direction? I think it's also recognizing the opportunity because, uh, you know, I think it's pretty impressive that she recognized how she could change these things into something positive. Any thoughts, any comments, any questions, anything that really resonated with someone that they want to kind of take with them into the week? I love that it's an energetic thing. I love that it's like, it's looking at the underlying motivation as a neutral thing. But that's awesome. I really, really resonate with that because it takes shame out of the equation. It totally does. And it's like, we've got whatever the next couple of weeks, we'll talk about what the tools are, how to change. But it totally takes the, the and, it, and it shows us. And I think when you think about it, right, you think about, Ashen Harana, gossiping about other people. So it's such a divisive thing. But the drive to do it is incredible, right? The drive for connection, like, that's, you know, there's no shame in, in doing that. It's just like, oh, now I know what I need to do. And now I know that I need to channel. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I'd love to hear your feedback. And if you enjoyed this episode, you'll love my book, Living Beautifully how to bring meaning, joy, and love into your life based on the timeless wisdom of Pirkei Avot. And please take a moment to rate, to review, and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out. Have a wonderful day.